Well, hello everyone, and um, we are now going to enter the second century AD in our course of um, uh, ancient Roman history. And it will begin with two emperors, both of them extraordinary, and those are the two that we will cover today. Uh, the uh, really three quarters of the second century will be the rule of what Gibbon called the rule of five good emperors. Nerva adopted a brilliant commander who had already proven himself, and that was Trajan. Uh, I mean, adoption was always the case in the first century Roman emperors, but they usually adopted relatives, even, even if the relatives were uh, far removed. In this case, this was an adoption by merit, and that's what will really work very well. Uh, he was also the first non-Roman-born emperor, because he was born in Spain. Uh, and, uh, as I said, he will prove himself um, an amazing man in every respect, uh, primarily, first of all, as a military leader. By his death in the year 117, the Roman Empire will extend to its largest uh, limits. In fact, the emperors after him will pull, will pull back a bit, because it was just, they would feel that it was not manageable. But, uh, uh, better to be able to manage well what they already had rather than to extend themselves too far. He was emperor from uh, 98 to 17 and so good was he in every respect that he was in fact was officially declared by the Senate as Optimus Princess, which is the best, uh, the best ruler. And um, he was uh, known as a brilliant administrator, as a uh, very philanthropic um, uh, man. Uh, he uh, a great builder and uh, also an, a, a, an initiator of wonderful public uh, programs. So after his death, there was a saying uh, that every time a new emperor was elected. Every one of them was honored by the Senate with the wish Felicior Augusto Melior Traiano, the, uh, the luckier than Augustus and uh, better than Trajan. So those two were really the roadblocks as to the, the best rule. So as you see, portrayed here very much in the same uh, fashion as uh, Augustus of Prima Porta and, uh, and uh, that's, that sculpture, that attitude uh, certainly became uh, the the roadmark as well. And here it is, both of them. Uh, this one is bronze, so it doesn't need support. This is the extent uh, of the Roman Empire under Trajan. The light green is where Trajan went between the years 114 and his death um, 117. The Romans always preferred to stay to um, to the west of the Rhine, right here, to the west of the Rhine and to the south of the Danube. He crossed the Danube and went into the so-called Dacia, which, uh, which is today's Romania, pretty much. He also went into Mesopotamia, Armenia, so that was difficult to hold. Uh, the Romans preferred to stay to, um, to the west of Euphrates as well, but uh, Trajan went all the way. Other emperors will pull back. One of his greatest constructions, and he built everywhere. Everywhere he went, he built, because uh, uh, I may have said before that the a Roman army, they perhaps fought uh, <laughs> some of the time, obviously, but 75% of their time was occupied with setting up camp, uh, building, building roads, building bridges, uh, building construction. Uh, that's what they did, and, uh, and Trajan certainly put them to the task. He built so much outside uh, I would say Rome itself, uh, but in Rome, in Rome, he embarked on the um, biggest forum that had yet been constructed, and that forum will come to be known as um, the uh, uh, Forum of Trajan. Um, now, if you remember our map, this is our original um, uh, Roman Forum, right here. This is the Forum of Caesar. This is the Forum of Augustus. Uh, Vespasian will also build a forum here and then and then Domitian will build that forum transitorum that we mentioned last time. So all of these had already been built. 
uh, here. And then Trajan acquired this enormous amount of land right here to the, uh, well, northwest of Augustan Forum and built this enormous Forum of Trajan. The Forum itself is here and instead of building a temple as uh, had been the case before, as you remember, Julius Caesar built a temple to uh, Venus Genetrix and then Augustus in his own Forum built a temple to Mars Ultor and then Augustus also supplied a focal uh, point for the old Roman Forum and built the temple right here of Julius Caesar. Um, so all of these forums had temples. With Trajan, interestingly, instead of doing a temple at the end of the, uh, uh, of the forum, he built a huge basilica. And it will be called Basilica Ulpia because uh, that was the last name, Ulpius, uh, of, uh, of the family. Now, there is a temple right here behind the basilica, the Temple of Trajan, but most probably that temple was not built by Trajan because uh, he was a humble man. Uh, he would not be building a temple to himself. So it most probably was built uh, by Hadrian, by the, uh, by the next emperor. Here's another picture that you can see better. There we are. Here is our Roman Forum. Then Julius Caesar Forum right here. There's Vespasian. There is Forum Transitorum, the very, very narrow one, as you see, that the mission built for himself, but that was renamed in honor of Nerva. Here is the Forum of Augustus, and here, this very large one, is the Forum of Trajan. Here you can see it. Um, one entered through a triumphal arch, which we know the look of from coins only. So there was a triumphal arch. In the middle uh, was the equestrian statue of Trajan, he, um, he ate uh, the form of Augustus by creating these two round excedrae, but then he also, in his basilica, he created two apses on each side, and they were parallel to the excedrae. Then behind the basilica, you see, he created this very, very unusual column that we'll be looking at. It's called the Column of Trajan, and out of the entire forum, that one is actually left intact. And then on each side of the column, there was sort of a bit of a courtyard, and on each side of the column uh, was a library. It was a Greek library and a Roman library. And then behind, you see, the Temple of Deified Trajan, which probably was, um, was built by Hadrian. Here you can see, you see these excedrae on the Augustan Forum? And then Trajan repeated the same feature. There's one excedrae, second, and then the two more next to the basilica. These are all recreations, of course, that are oh, by, by an artist. I mean, it was supposed to be spectacular, of course, all done in marble. It's possible that there were multicolored uh, polychrome uh, marble, which would make it even more uh, beautiful. And uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps trees on each side. Then here's the basilica. This basilica was entered from the side, and uh, one could enter from either side of the basilica. Here, um, the, uh, the very large space, I mean, it's hard to tell. We can only tell from descriptions of contemporaries and, um, and coins, but the Clary's story, clearly, the upper Clary's story was very, very large. Here, uh, an artist uh, imagined it, in fact, as just completely open. Uh, the inside of the basilica, uh, here too with the great men of Rome commemorated in sculpture and uh, this basilica would serve judicial purposes uh, that be a law court the uh, judgments would be would be reached um, in this basilica here's still another view and as you see we entered the basilica from from the courtyard from the large uh, uh, from the forum itself and then through the basilica we can see uh, the column that we'll talk about, and the two libraries, and still another gate behind. Uh, this is just an imaginative recreation of one of the libraries, uh, and there would be cupboards with scrolls, and by this time, uh, yes, by this time they would also have codexes, which, which is 
books as we know it, but with parchment, not paper, which is skin of animals, uh, specifically treated. But uh, here an artist just represents the inside of a library with the scrolls, with the reading tables, uh, a public library. Uh, Apollodorus of Damascus was Trajan's architect, who was a brilliant man. This is how we know what the uh, main gate looked like, only from the coins. Here it is, there should be six horses, here's the recreation with four horses, there should be six. But something like this, here it shows six horses, one entry and statues right there. Here again, this is our forum, here's our Basilica Ulpia, and these are the Excedras with porticos, and the Excedras are as a parallel by the apses on, uh, on the basilicas. There are two libraries and the column of Trajan. Now, here, Trajan also built spectacular markets, and of those, we'll go into them and we'll see what they look like. So those do remain. Uh, a lot of it has remained. Uh, and uh, so it was, it was, there was a whole complex. It was not only the forum where, of course, uh, traditional shops and, uh, and offices were held, but in addition to the forum, there was a whole market space right behind it. And Apollodorus of Damascus used the hill, uh, one of the seven hills, to, to, to build up a terraced market, all supported by cement, of course. Quite, quite amazing. Here, this is the uh, column of Trajan, right there. Uh, presumably this uh, is the brainchild of Apollodorus as well. Nothing like this had been done before. I mean, obviously there were columns, but not quite like this column. Because uh, <laughs> he conceived of this column as a spindle for a scroll. Uh, because on both sides there were libraries with a lot of scrolls, and a scroll has a spindle. He conceived of a column. Some yeah. people consider this to be the first movie. Exactly. It's the same sort of thing. It's, uh, it's the first, yeah, it's the it's, first. It's like a film. Yeah. It's like a film, a, a roll of film that's uh, that's wrapped around the column um, so many times. It's dedicated to uh, Trajan's two uh, campaigns in Dacia, above, to the north of Danube, in today's uh, Romania. And everything is described. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. And then on top of the column was a heroic new sculpture of uh, Trajan himself, and remember, nudity is sort of a, a costume. It's a costume that uh, that underscores the classicizing uh, heroic virtues of um, of the emperor. Now, today, of course, there's no, that that uh, statue is lost, and we have Saint Peter's there, uh, not in heroic nudity. At the time, one could probably climb up on the uh, balcony in the two libraries and the basilica and see it, uh, see it this way. But it was, it was painted, so this is just a recreation of how it may have been painted. painted. Um, also, there may have, been, may have been designs exhibited in one of the libraries or both libraries so that one could actually see what's carved on the column. Uh, and the, the artisans who carved it were very, very good. It appears as if the carving is of considerable depth but it's only about uh, five centimeters. It's really, uh, it's not that deep. Uh, but the skill is uh, of the carvers so good that, that, they, uh, that the visual impression is that of uh, uh, a greater depth. This is what it looks like today. The column, it is the original column. It is there with all its carving. And the height is about uh, 115 feet, and it was carved between 106 and 113 AD. Um, and everything is really depicted here. Uh, not only uh, the, the fight, but also all the other things that, that were done by the troops. Here you see the personification of the river Danube, right there. And these all of these constructions that was all built by the soldiers. And you see how the pontoon bridge was constructed across Danube. And here are the soldiers coming out of the, uh, uh, of the city on their way, um, and here and here they are building, and tra and Trajan is everywhere. He oversees everything. He, in fact, uh, the, the the army loved him because he completely he shared uh, their life. Uh, he shared their rough quarters. He shared their meals. Nothing. He uh, did not treat himself 
in any way as someone better than themselves, except, of course, as a jail of battle. In addition to the forum in Rome, well, as I said, he, he built everywhere, everywhere he went. So, but one of the greatest buildings is the forum, of course, and that column, which is stupendous, and one can, in fact, learn what went on during his campaigns from, from the column. He also built a bridge, Apollodorus, who came with him wherever he went. He built an incredible bridge uh, over the Danube. The amazing part is that it stood for 170 years, 170 years, because, I mean, usually the ice is so strong and the flow of the river, and in the winter, all structures, all, I mean, a bridge <laughs> stands maybe one season, and then the ice and the flow take it down. This bridge uh, stood for 170 years. So here it is, on each side of the bridge was uh, a Roman um, fortification or a castrum. One of the reasons we know what the bridge looks like, because it's right there on the column. In the foreground is, uh, is Trajan, sacrificing next to the Danube. And here's the, and here's, this is, this is where the bridge was built. And here is the reconstruction of uh, this bridge. Uh, the engine Apollodorus used wooden arches, each spanning 38 meters, which is 125 feet, set on 20 masonry pillars made of brick, mortar, and porcelana cement. And here it is, rather amazing. And uh, as you go, uh, as you study the, uh, the column, and you can find, uh, uh, you can find the entire column uh, on, uh, online, of course, today, and uh, you see, you see uh, the soldiers, what they do, uh, you see Trajan uh, participating in everything. It's, uh, it's rather fascinating. Here, here is Trajan with his lieutenants, and... Um, doing his adlacusio, I mean, talking to the soldiers. This is a photograph, another detail, and this is the adlacusio, as I said, and that's when uh, Trajan speaks to his men from a platform, but he was entirely approachable. Uh, here's still another uh, uh, part of the column where they're crossing the river, and uh, in this case, we do see a battle, and it's interesting how, uh, how the sculptors compare the cool composure of a Roman with the emotionalism of a barbarian. And yes, I know you like the barbarian. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I know you like the barbarian. But uh, they certainly don't forget to set those together. Inside the column, there was a spiral staircase uh, that went up that one, could, uh, that one could ascend in order to make repairs. I mean, the Romans were always mindful of maintenance. And now we're going to the market itself because then we can actually walk in. And the market is right here, right next to this eccentra. And here it is. Uh, now, this today is the form of Trajan. These columns had been resurrected, so to speak. I mean, they were all originally fallen down, but they had been resurrected. And we are looking at it here. We are right now in the market, and we are looking down at the forum. The basilica is gone, and the column is there, and we are positioned in the market, right here, up the hill. And now we are on the opposite side. We are looking at the market itself. The forum was still very classicizing. Classicizing, marble, uh, as, as Augustus had started it. But the market now, there was the new fashion of exposed brick. Just as we like exposed brick, now the exposed brick again came into fashion. And uh, the entire market was done in exposed brick. As you see, this is where it, um, uh, around the etc. right here. And then uh, the, the tower, the tower is a medieval tower. It's one of the medieval towers, so uh, cancel out the tower. Now we are in the forum itself. These are the remnants of the basilica, and there is the market. And now we are in the market again. We are back in the market, looking, looking at the forum, right here, the other side of the forum. Here is the forum itself right there. These are our etc. There's the forum, the Augustan forum, right here. This is the forum of Julius Caesar, and there's the market, right there, behind the etc. And here it is. Um, it was done with growing bolts, 
which, uh, which is different. Again, Apollodorus of Damascus, again the same man uh, was behind this. And by using the growing bolting as he did, and this was really the first time of, of using it on such a scale, uh, he, was, he was able to cut the clerestory windows and allow a lot of light uh, to, uh, to come in. Uh, today it is a museum, one can just walk around. But basically, again, I mean, the thing, Quaker Bridge Mall, it's, um, it was a shopping mall. That's what this market was. Um, this is the view from the Trajan Market. This is one of the streets in between. Here would be shops, right here, and a window above the shops because that was a storage area. And this is probably the closest in Rome as we can get to walking Roman streets. And those are the streets, that's the streets that we just saw. Reconstruction again of the shops at the back of the markets. As you can see, it's uh, I mean, shop, shop, shops and the corridors in between in our, just like our shopping malls. Uh, the uh, Roman architectural revolution. We, we talked a lot about the Greeks being the intellectuals and the Romans being the doers, and, it, and it's true. But uh, while being the doers, they certainly had a sense of aesthetic. I mean, look at the Pont de Gare. And, um, and they were just brilliant engineers. They were brilliant administrators, brilliant engineers, brilliant lawgivers. I mean, those three stay, still stay with us. Of course, the Greek intellectualism stays with us as well. So we are very, very, we are the very lucky heirs to those contributions. Um, so barrel vault, remember? Our barrel vault, very heavy, and the outward thrust onto the walls, makes the walls want to collapse, therefore the walls have to be very thick. And um, as long as it's masonry, uh, one cannot pierce uh, the, uh, the vault with windows because uh, it would compromise the structure. Now, here's the groin vault, and the groin vault is when two barrel bolts intersect at right angles. The thrust now is at the intersections. So all the thrust goes into these very, very large piers. They have to be large uh, to hold it but it opens up space, it opens up space between the piers for light, for walking. But this is what, uh, this is what Apollodorus did. He, he created consecutive groin vaulting, and it's called fenestrated sequence of groin vault. Fenestrate, fenestra is, uh, is a window, and as such, you see, because it's opened up, he was able to allow light through the clerestory windows, through the second story windows, what we see here. And there the growing vault. And um, this is an arch that's turned on its side. Hadrian was a relative. Hadrian was also born in Spain, and he too was an extraordinary military commander. Um, he was also an intellectual. Uh, I mean, Trajan, of course, was very versed in the seminal Greek works and Roman works, obviously. But uh, Hadrian all the more so. I mean, in fact, they called him a Greekling because he absolutely admired Greek culture. He felt that there was just no culture that, uh, that could surpass the Greek culture. And as a result, he, uh, he pulled back some of Trajan's conquests because he felt that uh, they were not easily manageable. But also, the next emperors, uh, I mean, they'll, they'll pull out of Mesopotamia and ultimately they'll, they'll even pull out of Dacia and to, to a barbarian, as the Romans called them, mind, uh, that was seen as a weakness. And Hadrian was the first certainly to stop any, any other expansion. Now, a great book to read <laughs> is um, Memoirs of Hadrian. Uh, it's written by Margaret Eusenar from the point of view of Hadrian, who is definitely an intellectual. And he talks a lot about Trajan as well. And he talks about the women, the wives, uh, about uh, uh, Antinous, who was, uh, who was his uh, beloved lover. So Hadrian spent most of the time, in fact, visiting provinces and uh, not that much time in Rome proper. And wherever he went, he built and built and built on a huger scale even than Trajan. In fact, he absolutely determined to recreate Athens in its Periclean glory of the middle of the 5th century BC, and, and he did. Uh, but he also traveled in, um, uh, in Egypt, uh, which is where Antinous will drown in the Nile under very suspicious circumstances. He was also a great hunter. He loved hunting, uh, big game hunting, lion hunting, 
and uh, went against the lion himself. He made, in fact, he made hunting popular. Because he went everywhere and everywhere he went, uh, statues of him were erected. Uh, his features are very familiar. And uh, we have more busts of Hadrian than of anyone else, really, of any other emperor. And because he uh, became emperor on the death of Trajan, he was already, I think, in his early 40s. And that's, he froze at that age. He did not try to make himself youthful, but he is, uh, he, he has this, this very robust, uh, handsome face of, an, uh, of a man in his early 40s. He also began to, he grew a beard because, uh, it, well, he loved all things Greek, and uh, Greek in Greece, adult men uh, wore beards. So Hadrian, not only he made hunting very popular, he also made uh, beards very popular, and the majority of emperors after him uh, uh, grew a beard. The bronze statue, uh, it may have been used for ritual worship, uh, and one of the few extant bronze sculptures. There are plenty of marble, but the bronze, uh, I mean, very few bron oh, bronze monuments remain because I mean, bronze was a very expensive uh, material and uh, was usually melted. Melted for weapons, melted for coins. The muscle, this is, he's wearing the muscle cuirass. Uh, it's the cuirass that, uh, that repeats uh, the human body the human muscles. The figures there, are, they look like some sort of archaic warriors and they wear archaic uh, um, gear and we don't know what it's about. Here uh, is a marble statue of Hadrian. He is wearing his military uh, cuirass again and his polydomentum and uh, on, on the cuirass is uh, uh, a personification again of uh, of Roma, a personification of Roma victorious, because then the two, uh, the two goddesses, the two goddesses of victory, the two Nikes, are crowning her, and then she is standing on, on a she-wolf, and then under his foot is a conquered barbarian. He himself is wearing a laurel crown, and it looks pensive. And here you see it, here you see the personification of Roma, and uh, on both sides, there's a, they're both crowning her. And then here's the wolf, the she-wolf, with two little babies. Uh, and here we come to, to Antinous. Uh, he was uh, a beautiful youth from Bithynia and, uh, that uh, Hadrian encountered on his travels and um, became his beloved companion and went everywhere with him. Uh, in Egypt, uh, under very... Uh, strange circumstances. No one knows, uh, there's no way to know if he was pushed, committed suicide, gave himself as a human sacrifice, slipped and drowned by accident, and then Hadrian will live till 138. So for eight years he will be inconsolable. Which, I mean, he was married, of course, uh, but uh, no children, and he was married, I think, to Trajan's niece. And uh, as I said, uh, Hadrian wept in front of the entire court. There are a lot of marble sculptures of Antinous, because uh, when he died, uh, he, Hadrian immediately, immediately deified him, and in fact uh, founded a city on the Nile, uh, at the spot where, uh, where Antinous died, which he called uh, uh, Antinopolis, and established a cult of uh, Antinous as god with the temple and uh, and with priesthood and it was actually a popular a popular cult uh, at that time in Rome uh, but then the Romans were very accepting of all sorts of cults and uh, uh, as I said I mean Hadrian was incon inconsolable this is an iconographic uh, model of his statue as Osiris Antinous in other words he died he was deified he became he became Osiris and uh, there's an attempt here to to replicate the Egyptian statues, but the sculptors uh, were such humanists and so influenced by the humanizing influence of classical Greece that, of course, they couldn't help themselves. And, and, and even now, on the surface, yes, one, uh, one leg in front of the other, the attempt at stiffness, but there's so much humanity in the sculpture that, um, so it's very classicizing uh, uh, Egyptian sculpture. He declared that Antinous was a god. Right, uh, and the proclamations, of course, were sent throughout the empire. So that's Hadrian's life. Now, in Rome itself, uh, 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 he did 
well, he, he built a lot, but uh, one of the most conspicuous and extraordinary places that he built is his own villa, which is outside of Rome and uh, in, in Tivoli. And uh, here is uh, here's the villa. It was, uh, it was of a great scope. It took no less acreage than the uh, uh, Golden House of Nero, but it was outside of Rome, so nobody cares. Nobody cared. And there he kind of created his own, his own world. And interestingly, there was another world underneath in the tunnels because all the servants and all the slaves traveled underneath so that they wouldn't be seen. There's the round structure right here. It's, it's number two. This was his, it seems to have been his personal quarters. And here's that, that, round, uh, that round structure. And here it is again right here and here it is it's called um, i mean uh, the archaeologists gave it the name of maritime theater hadrian who did um fashion, i mean who did uh, imagine himself very much as an architect didn't wasn't in love with straight lines which is strange considering that uh, that he was in love with everything greek and uh, greek architecture was always very rectilinear but, and I mean, Hadrian built enough of rectilinear architecture, of course, as well. But he also, he also loved uh, circuitous lines. And uh, here is the maritime theater with its own moat. And uh, this, again, is a recreation of what it may have looked like. And this is where it was kind of, it was uh, sort of a villa inside the villa. Um, and uh, this is where Hadrian presumably loved to spend uh, his... Uh, moments alone in, uh, in this maritime theater. It was all beautifully, beautifully decorated, of course, with uh, gorgeous art, spectacular architecture. Um, unfortunately, this is, uh, this is what we have today, and uh, this, is what, uh, this is what it looks like. Again, this is some of the recreations, just so you can see, because we don't exactly know what it looked like. Uh, only from, again, only from descriptions. There were two sets of baths. One set of bath was not in the maritime theater but very close by and uh, there was the, those were the baths, personal baths for Hadrian and his uh, inner circle and um, they were called Helio Caminos baths and which means uh, exposed to the sun and uh, here again is uh, this uh, concave architecture that he liked so much. I mean he loved um, uh, he loved cupolas and domes, and he also uh, liked um, the, the sort of the pumpkin structures on uh, on his domes. Uh, here again, uh, well, we're not sure. Here we have now exposed brick, of course, but it's possible that uh, that uh, it was covered with, the mar with marble, as baths usually are. And the Romans were extremely mindful of hygiene, and uh, I, there's an anecdote that. Uh, one, one of these emperors was asked once by, by the Trajan or Hadrian, um, why do why do you bathe once a day? And uh, and the answer was, well, I just don't have to. I just don't have the time to, to do it twice. <laughs> so these are the personal baths of the emperor, and then also in the villa there were uh, large bath and small bath complexes, but they were together sort of for the guests. Um, and here are the large and small bath complexes, and they welcomed the guests and the residents. Well, if the guests were, of course, of uh, great stature, then they would be using Hadrian's baths. It all depended, of course, on uh, one's position in, in social hierarchy. Because of all the travels, uh, Hadrian loved giving uh, structures in that villa uh, names of places where he traveled. Um, that didn't mean that uh, he copied the place, just the names. So one of them was, um, uh, was called the uh, Canopus, right there, which is a place in Egypt, right there. Also the uh, Canopus Canal, Canopus Canal joined Alexandria with the Nile and uh, brought fresh water from the Nile to Alexandria. So this is, it, it's essentially a pool, sort of, a little bit like the, the one we saw at the Villa of the Papyri. And, uh, and here it is. This is the Canopus. And at the end of the Canopus, there'll be another sort of pumpkin, pumpkin-like uh, structure that uh, Hadrian will call the Serapis. And that has nothing to do with the Temple of Serapis in Egypt either. 
but this is what it is today, right here. Uh, we may come back to this. It's about 121 meters and a half. Uh, as you see at the end of the pool, um, there's this uh, tremendous structure here where, uh, where the lintel, the Greek architecture, operated with the two posts and a lintel, rectilinear architecture. But what these, uh, what Hadrian did here, and we don't really know who designed it. It may be very, very well that he designed it himself. But here, the lintel uh, goes straight and goes into a semicircle, straight into a semicircle, which is entirely against all classical Greek habits. And here it is with the, I mean, these are all, of course, copies. Uh, the Canopus had two allegories, one allegory of the Nile and another allegory of the Tiber. And for the Nile, of course, we have, um, we have the crocodile, and for the Tiber, here's the allegory over the Tiber, and it's still there. Now, these are recreations, and we'll go back and see what, what it's like today. And uh, he, he had these cariatids uh, and, one, uh, uh, and one atlas right here, holding up another lintel. Here is another recreation of what it may have looked like with the sculptures in between right there. This is what it looks like today. Uh, the villa had a great deal of sculpture, beautiful, beautiful sculpture. We'll look at it presently. Uh, I mean, it's still very, very beautiful, of course. Uh, here, the cariatids, uh, still there. I mean, they were all replaced. And here, here is what you call the Serapis, a fountain, just beautifully arranged fountain with sculpture. And this, too, designed as, as a pumpkin. And you can just imagine uh, the diners would just sit there and... Uh, and face this glory while being served their beautiful meals. Here, here's another, and that's what it looks like. And you, I mean, you would take your meal right here on this terrace. Um, a number of sculptures were found there, just as a number of sculptures were found in the uh, Villa of the Papyri. This is the Scobulus. Uh, it's a copy, but it's a bronze copy. Uh, we know it mostly from Roman, Roman marble copies, but the original Discobolus was, uh, was cast by, uh, by a great sculptor by the name of Myron, who was uh, a contemporary of Phidias in uh, the middle of the 5th century uh, BC. The original Greek bronze is lost, but this survived. And uh, this is one of the, I mean, we're not going to talk about the Greek sculpture now, but it's one of the first examples of, uh, of the ability of the Greeks to catch the moment of of, of movement. Uh, in fact, uh, the moment where the man had just bent, uh, he's just about to release uh, the uh, the disc, and this is this is that that moment in between. So so three moments uh, all in one. It's quite amazing, and uh, the whole sculpture itself sort of looks like a, like a taut bow that about to spring. Fabulous. Uh, here uh, here is. Uh, what we usually see uh, in marble, but the face is uh, more expressive in bronze. Beautiful mosaics everywhere. Now these, I, I mean, it looks like paint because the tesserae, tiny, tiny, tiny. It's it's uh, almost unbelievable that it's a mosaic. I, I, I don't know how, how many little tesserae this thing contains. It's uh, just just extraordinary. Uh, here is another. It's, she's called Diana of Versailles, and. Uh, it's the goddess uh, uh, Artemis uh, with a deer. And the reason because there was a hero by the name of Action, who uh, he was a hunter and he was in a forest and uh, and by chance uh, he didn't mean to. He saw Diana Ar Artemida, Artemida bathing in the lake, uh, and of course no mortal was allowed to to see a goddess in the nude unless she wished uh, for him to do so. So Artemida uh, turned him into a deer. And then his own dogs, uh, in fact, hunted him down. So, to his death. And that's why Artemida is always portrayed with a deer. Another, uh, the Lily uh, Venus, is quite spectacular. And this one, this one lives in the British Museum. And also just a gorgeous statue. Just very, very beautiful. It's called the Crouching Venus. And, uh, and then, of course, another Antinous. I mean, there are many, many Antinouses. Uh, these two spectacular bronzes, and they are actually bronzes, they, they also come from, uh, from the Villa of Hadrian, 
and uh, Monsignor Giuseppe Alessandro Furietti discovered them in 1736 and they became part of uh, his tremendous uh, collection of antiquities and he refused to gift them to Pope Benedict XIV which cost him uh, a cardinal set. So he preferred to hang on to his bronzes rather than become a cardinal. Wow, the Pope really blackmailed him saying yes. give them to me or yes. else? Yeah, of course. Huh? Of course. Uh, here they are. Uh, the, the two brilliant centaurs. Um, okay, another building that uh, Hadrian built in Rome is uh, the Temple of Venus and Rome. It's a double temple, in fact. It's, and he built it according to the, uh, the Greek rule of, uh, of the columns that go around the entire periphery. So the building is entirely surrounded by columns, and it has two entrances and two separate cellars, one for Roma, one for Venus. And in order to build this, because this, um, this Colossus of Nero, remember, Nero's Colossus, in fact, stood there. And so it had to be moved at the same time it was refashioned as Helios. And 20 elephants, 24 elephants were necessary to move this Colossus. Uh, but he did move him, and it's from him that Colosseum got its name as Colosseum, not because of the Colosseum's own size. Here it is. This is a recreation. It doesn't exist anymore, as you can imagine. Uh, it's set on a platform, and it is here where Apollodorus really opened his mouth and inserted foot. He criticized Hadrian before for, for the pumpkin architecture, as he called it. And here he suggested that in order to compete with the Colosseum, this temple should be on a much higher platform. And he was right about it. But, uh, but he also criticized uh, Hadrian's proportions, and, and he felt that he was building a cow barn more than a real temple, even though ostensibly it looked like one. And he paid with his life for this. I mean, even though Hadrian himself was a great humanist, and uh, but he was still a man, and uh, and Apollodorus was certainly not very diplomatic, particularly knowing how important it was for Hadrian to to um, imagine himself a great architect. Mm -hmm. And Apollodorus was a great architect. Well, he was right, but, um, but this is what the temple looked like, and it was a ten-column frontal temple, which is uh, nothing like this existed in Italy itself. Um, the Temple of Artemis, I think, in Ephesus was, uh, may have been, um, in today's Turkey, may have been uh, uh, ten columns, but nothing like this existed in Rome. So it was a tremendous structure all, all around, and then it sat as if inside its own forum, with porticos all around. This is what we have today. This is what it looks like today. And, and of course, there would be a dome there, or a semi-dome. Uh, this is the semi-dome and uh, the statue of Roma, and then the same thing would be in the other, in the adjacent temple, the, the statue of Venus. And here's the recreation, and, and beautiful, absolutely beautiful colored marble was used throughout. So Apollodorus may have been right, but I'm sure it looked quite stupendous. This is what we have today. Temple of poor Apollodorus was right. The twin temples are proportioned more like a cow barn than like either a Greek or Roman temple. Right or not, his criticism of Hadrian design cost him his head. Uh, this is the original temple, and this is as it was redesigned in uh, the early 4th century. Uh, and now we come probably to, <laughs> uh, to the greatest of, uh, of Hadrian's structures, not least because it survived, and uh, survived very well. Indeed, it was turned into a Christian church, and as a result, it survived almost intact. Obviously, we can't say it was entirely intact, but uh, almost intact. This is called the Pantheon, which is the, uh, the temple of all gods. Even though, frankly, we really don't know, it may have been a meeting hall, but, well, it's called the Pantheon today. Pan as in Pan American Airlines, so it's or encompassing all gods, Pantheon. Uh, here it is, and of course it has a dome. The original design was that, again, of a forum, essentially. So there was a small forum right here, and a very, very large temple. So the proportions were off uh, compared to, uh, uh, to various uh, to, to traditional forums, such as Julius Caesar or, um, or Augustan Forum, but even Trajan, as you saw, already, instead of having a temple, just built an enormous basilica uh, at a 90-degree angle to 
um, to the axis of the forum. And what Hadrian did, he did not build his own forum, but he did this, he built this. So it was sort of a Hadrian's forum. There was no Hadrian statue there. There was presumably one of those billboards, one of the triumphal arches. All these emperors, of course, built tri triumphal arches everywhere. Uh, because there were billboards advertising their achievements. Trajan did it and Hadrian did it. So uh, today this is all gone and in fact the ground grew, well you saw it with the Trajan Forum about uh, 30 feet and so there are no steps any longer. I mean some but not much. The, uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, all of this is gone. This is a Baroque fountain right in front of it. It's an eighth column, uh, it, it's a traditional eighth column Portico, as in, cl in a classical temple. The columns are monoliths, so one piece of stone, in other words, instead of, instead of drums. Corinthian capitals, and here, here it says Marcus, that it was built by Marcus Agrippa, not Hadrian. And the reason for that is uh, putting aside the fact that, that uh, he had Apollodorus murdered, which is dreadful. He was a humble man and uh, he uh, did not wish to put his name there and there was a temple there before that was built by Marcus Agrippa who was, you may remember, a friend of um, Augustus and who was also Augustus's general and he is the one uh, who uh, was victorious over Anthony and Cleopatra in the year 31 uh, BC at Actium off the shore of Greece. So it's that Marcus Agrippa who built a temple here, and it was probably a traditional temple. There was, uh, uh, but uh, it burned a couple of times and then needed to be rebuilt, and so uh, Hadrian began from scratch. He did, however, uh, construct a very classicizing porch, as you see, but uh, but left the inscription there as uh, that Marcus Agrippa did that. So it was built, as you see, immediately uh, after Trajan's, Trajan's death, because that's when uh, Hadrian uh, became, uh, became emperor. And um, it took eight years. Yeah. It's a revolutionary design. It's, uh, it's uh, probably even Apollodorus uh, wouldn't have any criticism uh, about that, because it was really spectacular. There's no question that, that Hadrian participated in designing the Pantheon. So, Classical entry, once you walk in, there were no precedents uh, for this kind of building. Uh, so there's a drum in the back, there's a round drum and, uh, and a dome sitting on top of it, as you see here. And uh, if you remember the mausoleum of, um, well, the mausoleum of Mazolus uh, in Halicarnacus, uh, he too had, on top of his mausoleum, he had this stepped architecture, stepped design as you see it here. The way it was designed it was as a sphere. Essentially it was designed as a sphere. It was absolutely tremendous. So the height of the structure was identical to its width. And the feeling when one walks in is of tremendous space. And then there is an opening. Uh, there's a 10 meter opening um, up on top, which is 30 feet about. Uh, through which light comes in, uh, light, rain, there are devices under the floor that take care of, uh, of the rain and the water. Uh, it's, it's constructed of concrete and uh, the, depending on where this concrete is used, different mixes uh, are used in, in uh, concrete. For instance, with the foundation, they would use an incredibly strong basalt or granite and, uh, and then on the other hand, in the dome itself, uh, they would use something something very light, like tufa, uh, and um, so the con and the flexibility that's allowed uh, by concrete structures, it was used uh, to to its full extent, really quite tremendously, and you can see that the uh, the dome changes in width and becomes uh, lighter and lighter, and then of course the uh, the opening on top, which uh, Masonry could never could never allow because I mean it's like taking away the keystone from an arch the arch collapses whereas concrete of course allows for this um, uh, uh, for this structure the ceiling is coffered so that also lightens up the structure uh, the dome is stepped as I said but uh, sort of like the uh, uh, the mausoleum of of Mazolus and Artemisia if you remember 
Uh, and then uh, we, this began really with Nero and with Nero's palace. Uh, the Greeks, the Greek architecture was uh, rectilinear, as I said. And what they really did with their architecture, they limited space. They, uh, in their temple building, they, they just limited space with walls, period. I mean, they were, they were beautiful, and, uh, and the statuary was beautiful, the marbles were beautiful, but the architecture was very, very, very simple. Uh, whereas, as we saw, because of concrete, and we saw it already in the Golden House of Nero, that the Roman architects began to sculpt space. They began to play with space. They began to define it as, as different, uh, as different uh, volumes. And, uh, and you see it in the, uh, in the Pantheon as well, because uh, uh, they don't just limit the space, but they create these niches, and these the rectilinear niches, semicircular niches, all sorts of... And uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, now, the Pantheon still has a lot of the original marbles, so when you walk in, all of the, the floor, for instance, is original. Now, of course, the roof, the coffers themselves, used to have gilded bronze rosettes, so it would, in fact, uh, appear uh, as the firmament. And one felt very much underneath the firmament. And it's possible that it would be painted blue, and uh, in which case, of course, the rosettes would look like stars. And one was in the middle of the, <laughs> of the universe. It's, um, and one still feels it very much. And the only source of light is, um, is that oculus right there. So during the daytime, uh, when, when, when it doesn't rain, uh, you can watch the sun travel around the coffered ceiling. <laughs> Tremendous. And of course, well, during rain, the, the water comes in. That's the floor. That's the floor of the mosaics. And uh, it's very difficult because the space is so spectacular and, uh, and, and so voluminous. It's very difficult to take a photograph even, even with today's uh, very wide lens uh, cameras. So this is the best that could be done. And you can see the sun coming in uh, and hitting, uh, hitting the... Uh, the ceiling. So painting, of course, this is where painting comes to the rescue because a painter, of course, can manipulate uh, space much easier. And uh, this is Giovanni Paolo Panini, and uh, he is an 18th century painter, and uh, so this is uh, an 18th century uh, impression with 18th century travelers, and again, with the sun, of course, hitting the walls. And uh, here are just uh, several views. Here's the front. The side, the uh, the cut of interior, and um, the one from the from the top. Hadrian, uh, Hadrian was, uh, as I said, a humble man. Uh, so it was probably after his death that his successor Antonio Pius, you see, in uh, yes, Hadrian died one thirty eight, and this is one thirty five, forty five. So built a temple to divine Hadrian because, of course, he was deified as well. And this is what stands there today. Uh, it used to house the stock exchange. Uh, I mean, there are just some offices there. Um, the, uh, all the spaces between the columns used to be filled in with walls, as you see it in this, uh, in this illustration. But now, because of the restoration work, so all of this was freed, but there still, you can still see how the wall filled up uh, the space between the, uh, between the columns. Uh, there are some reliefs, and, uh, and as you've noticed, reliefs uh, reused continuously by uh, by the Romans as information pieces, uh, as historical uh, narratives to uh, to show the population what goes on where and what uh, events take place. Sort of the same thing as the reverse of um, of a coin. Now these come from uh, from Hadrian, and they represent various provinces. We don't exactly, we cannot tell exactly which province, but various provinces of the empire, uh, as they are personified. But we really don't know where they were placed. Here is a reconstruction, and uh, the painter here, you see, placed the provinces uh, right here. This is the reconstruction drawing of uh, the portico surrounding the temple. So it would be here somewhere. You see, right there. But, as I said, we don't exactly know where it is. Uh, this is another drawing uh, of the time when the walls uh, existed between the columns uh, of the temple. Still another building that, uh, that's very important, Hadrian's building, and that's his own mausoleum. And today it is known as um, 
this Castle Sant'Angelo uh, in Rome, and it was commissioned by Hadrian as a mausoleum for himself and, um, and his family, and then used by the popes as, um, as their fortress. It's also on the Tiber, here it is, and, and it even reminds us of the mausoleum of Augustus, and probably it looked similar to the mausoleum with, with an obvious reference to a great emperor. So this is our, this is Castle St. Saint Angelo, and then mausoleum of Augustus is right there. You see where the trees are? So it's obliquely um, across the Tiber, and then there's this, this little modern building that holds the Arapaches. Hadrian clearly imitated the Augustan design, and uh, so when we look at it, this could have been perhaps the Augustan mausoleum also. It seems we have finished our lecture for today, so uh, just to sum up, two, two great emperors, really great emperors, and they were in fact able to embrace all the uh, much proclaimed Roman virtues of uh, constancy and firmness and simplicity, complete dedication to, uh, to Rome at, at the expense of their own health and interests, these were the best. There was no question. There was really. So those two and then there'll be three more. I mean, there'll be two more. Uh, yes, because, um, uh, well, Nerva only was, I think, emperor for less than, for less than two years. But then at the end of the second century, uh, again, as a result, perhaps, of uh, of overreaching on the Trajan, but uh, there's so many, uh, there's so many theories that are proposed about the decline of the Roman Empire. Uh, but this is the best time to live there, the first half of the second century.